Good morning, everyone. Welcome to On the Porch. I'm excited to have this week's guest, Representative Jason Rojas, who is our majority leader. Good morning, Jason. Good morning, Jane. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Awesome. Awesome. Living the dream. Living the dream. Sure. We are. Um, you're the ninth district, right? And you cover East Hartford and Manchester. Right. And um, Tell us a little bit about your early years. I see you served on like Board of Education, a ton of things before getting to where you are now. Yeah, well, I, you know, I grew up uh, wanting to be mayor of East Hartford, which is my hometown, uh, for whatever reason, when I was a kid, nine, 10 years old. I read a lot of newspapers as a kid. I still do today. Um, but that got me interested, I think, in social studies, that kind of, you know, those type of uh, academic topics. And, um, you know, as I got into middle school and high school, I got involved in a lot of clubs. Um, and community service became very important to me. And I, the, the outlet that I identified for continuing that community service was politics. So when I got out of college, went back home and immediately got involved and, in, you know, was on the Inland Wetlands Commission, was on the Historic District Commission, and then a seat opened up on my school board and I ran for the school board seat. Um, and then I was appointed to the town council, uh, won, won a term on the town council. Um, and then when the seat opened up for the ninth district and 2008, uh, the mayor at the time, Melody Curry, who was a state rep, um, right. whose son is now a state rep, um, called me and said, listen, I think you'd be great at the, the legislature. I think you should run. And it was not something that had ever crossed my mind, uh, but I decided to run based on her advice um, and kind of the rest is history. Here I am uh, 15 years later and I've had an opportunity to serve in a number of leadership roles and I can get into that if you want me to, uh, but you know, now currently serving as majority leader. Right. Well, that's really exciting because you knew from an early age that that's what you wanted to do. You wanted something in that area, right? And I like that your whole background is helping you now because you know what happens in a town. You know what happens on the board of it. So you understand all of that. Um, how hard was the decision to run for state rep? You know, it wasn't that hard, right? I mean, I, I remember I was on my porch. I can remember vividly the conversation and I remember thinking, well, let me talk to my wife. I need to ask her. And then <laughs> Melody, Melody at the time was like, well, that's fine, but you're running. Um, and then after that, it really wasn't that hard. I mean, it was intimidating and new, right? Because it was a new type of office to run for. Quite frankly, I had never envisioned myself um, as being in the legislature. And then there were moments where like, am I actually qualified to do this, right? You have all these doubts about whether you're qualified to do a job. Um, and it was really intim intimidating to think about running for the legislature because I just wasn't all that familiar with it. Um, but obviously, I'm really glad that I, I did. And, you know, it's provided me an opportunity to learn about a farther, a broader breadth of policy, um, which is really what makes this job fascinating. I always tell the story, the first bill I ever worked on had to do with pig farm regulations. Again, not something I ever thought I would work on, not something I've run on ever since. Uh, but I actually ran into the person a couple of weeks ago um, who I helped on that issue. And they were still grateful for helping with change of pig farm re regulation, which was impacting a pig farm in my district. Right. That's what it's really all about. Um, you have a, you know, incredible civic um, background. What's your educational background? I was looking. That's pretty impressive also. Yeah, you know, I went to the University of Connecticut where I studied history. I actually started off studying political science and got bored. Go figure. I studied political science and then got bored of it and went into politics. Um, so instead, I ended up switching to history where I focused on African-American history since Reconstruction. Um, and then after that, you know, I went into the working world and after a couple of years decided to go back to school and get a master's degree. So I have a master's degree in public policy from Trinity College where I actually work, which I call my mortgage paying job because the state legislature is not my mortgage paying job. Trinity College is where I serve as a chief of staff to the president there. Yeah, that's really cool. So I find it exciting too. I can remember the first day at the Capitol and we had our first um, meeting in there and how wonderfully overwhelming it was. And I now compare it to a hamster cage because you know, in there, and you're our majority leader, which I'm glad that you decided to go into the legislature also um, because you you are an incredible leader and you bring people together. How do you feel when you're out in the session room? Uh, like in the House chamber? 
Yeah. yeah, you know, it's it's fun. I mean, it's a really exciting and fun place to be. You know, there's a lot more work that happens collaboratively between ourselves within our caucus, which is pretty diverse politically and, and from mm -hmm. a viewpoint perspective, uh, but also the dirty little secret that I like to tell people. We work really, re really well with our Republican colleagues, and there's no doubt that we have our disagreements about policy. I mean, when the cameras are on, we engage in the political theater that's part of the process. Uh, but overall, as I'm sure you're coming to find, right, there's a lot of really strong relationships between Democrats and Republicans in the legislature. And it's why, you know, anywhere from 85 percent, 85 to 90 percent of the legislation that comes out of the Capitol is actually bipartisan, nearly unanimous, um, 85, right. 90 percent of the time. Now that 10 to 15 percent of the time where we disagree on things, they're big issues. You know, it's taxes, it's criminal justice, it's social issues. Um, but even then, you know, there's a lot of collaborative work that takes place and ends up informing the final product, even if Republicans can't always be in favor of voting for it all the time. Right. It is a lot of work from, you know, day one of session and the committees. And now as committee chair, I see how much work goes in, right. um, you know, behind the scenes with the committee, et cetera. Um, that's really exciting. Um, I also noticed in your history that you've um, concentrated a lot on housing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, housing, I think, is probably one of those things, if you're comfortable in your housing, it's something you take for granted. I mean, you never take for granted that you have a mortgage payment or a rent payment. But generally speaking, most of us are stable in our housing. Um, but we also know it's it's one of the core components of our state's economy. Um, often housing, housing growth is an indicator of positive economic growth. I um, mean, I, I also think it's at the core of all the inequities that exist in our society as well, too, whether it's the achievement gap or disparities in health or disparities in criminal justice, uh, disparities in economic opportunity. A lot of it comes down to housing, where it gets built, and the type of housing and where it gets built. And we know um, that the long history of housing in the United States and here in Connecticut has resulted in us living in a really segregated society, both by income and race. Um, and that has ramifications for all of us, uh, regardless of where we live and regardless of our social standing. Um, and and I mean, again, it's key to our state's economic health, and we have not done enough to allow for the production of housing, and that's a multifaceted problem. Um, I know a lot of people just like to blame the towns um, and planning and zoning commissions for putting up obstacles, and those are fair criticisms, um, but the obstacles to housing production are beyond just, or beyond just local planning and zoning as well. But there are obviously changes that need to be made for us to allow for a greater diversity of housing to be developed. Um, because there's a lot of demand out there for it, right? I mean, I think traditionally we often think about housing in the context of single family housing, which is kind of, you know, what Amer what the American dream is built on. Um, but we now know that there are changing preferences for young people who are putting off on starting families or young people who want to live in, live in a core urban area. Or if you look at the other end of the demographic spectrum in our state, we're an older state, have an aging population who no longer want to live in a 2,500 square foot house or a four bedroom house and would like an apartment. It's just we haven't built multi-family or multi-unit housing um, to the extent that we need to over the last 20, 30 years. And that's why we're kind of seeing the housing crunch that we're seeing now with increasing rents and increasing homelessness. It all has to do with a lack of production of housing. Right. I know in my district of Windsor Locks, um, they did a facility. I forget how many units. It was an old factory building. Montgomery Mill. Montgomery, Mel, right? Montgomery and, Mel, yep. um, the, the developer was Beacon, and they specialize in this. And 60% is true affordable housing, according to your salary. And it's four years now. It is always full. It's a huge success. There's not issues that people in their mind have about affordable housing. It's right in the center on their main street. So it can be done and it is being done and we have to do more of it. Yeah, absolutely. I met with Beacon last week, actually. So did you? I did. Yeah. yeah. They're phenomenal. And phenomenal. they have a couple of products going on, uh, projects going on in Connecticut. So that's, that's, that's really great news. What other top issues are on your radar? Um, you know, I mean, housing is the big one. The budget is always a big one for all of right. us right? in the first year of a new term. Um, you know, it's one of those interesting moments. I've been in the legislature for 15 years and for 13 of those 15, we didn't have any money. Uh, right. It was tough economic conditions. Um, my earlier years in the legislature, we were making really, really difficult decisions about cutting programs and cutting spending and raising revenue to try to take a balanced approach at addressing some of the issues that we have. But now we're in a place where we have, you know, lots of revenue, right? The state's uh, state's economy is relatively healthy. Um, at the moment, we have a really uh, uh, healthy rainy day fund. 
revenues continue to be projected. So now we're fighting over money and how to spend it, as opposed to fighting over money and how to cut things. So um, it'll be an interesting debate. You know, we obviously we have a spending cap now um, that, you know, a true spending cap that we didn't have uh, prior to uh, six years ago. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see exactly, you know, we have people who are interested in cutting taxes, we have people who are interested in spending more, um, like any budget, there'll be compromises that have to be made. And it's likely that right. people, both sides of that debate will be happy and unhappy at the same time. Right. And I, I, you know, also being on appropriations now, I understand the process a little bit better. And it's not that we go out and we just spend, you know, money to spend it. A lot of thought is put into where we put the money where is the most need? What, you know, our workforce development, um, moving the state forward. Plus what I love is putting more, um, you know, keeping up our rainy day fund and doing all of that keeps us stable, right? Yeah, right. It's so important. I think it's one of those things that, you know, we tend to think in two year cycles. I think the average person tends to think about tomorrow. Um, but for us as policymakers, we have a responsibility to think in the long term, right? Not two years from now, but five years from now, 10 years from now, much like any normal business does, right? They think about the long term. And I think we need to do that too. We didn't do that for generations, which is why we had the challenges that we faced uh, following the recession in 2008 and 2009, um, where the bottom fell out of our uh, of our state's economy, primarily because we're so over-reliant on taxpayers from Fairfield County who make a lot of money on Wall Street, uh, so that when Wall Street catches a, a cold, we catch the flu here in Connecticut in terms of our collection of yeah. revenue. Um, so we always have to be sensitive to ensuring that we have a, a healthy rainy day fund. And it's important to have that because when there is a recession and revenues begin to fall, we're stuck with having to make draconian cuts to a lot of important programs that impact people's lives directly, or we have to look at increasing taxes, which is a real difficult thing to do in the middle of a recession too. So having that healthy rainy day fund will allow us to mitigate both of those issues, both raising taxes and making dr draconian cuts at a time um, when the economy can least afford to do both. Right. And we paid down the um, pensions, right? right? Which I understand weren't being fully funded since like 1940, the late 1940s, right? Since the system was created, it wasn't until Governor Malloy um, came into office where we started making the actual uh, the actual area required uh, payments every year. Governors before that, legislatures before that, on a bipartisan basis, didn't make those necessary payments, and the bill came due. Um, and we were left um, with the decision that, are we going to do the right thing, politically difficult thing, and begin to make those payments to the pension system? And then, of course, coming out of the 2017 bipartisan budget, um, where we put the volatility cap in place, um, that allow us to collect revenue and not allow us to use that revenue. What it did is require us to actually pay down some of those long-term debts, which heretofore hadn't been done for decades. Um, and we still have a lot of work to do on that front, but we're certainly headed in the right direction. Right. That Absolutely. So what's your favorite thing about being a legislator? A favorite thing about being a legislator? You know, I mean, I think it's the, on any given day, you have... 10 different issues that are presented for it to you. Um, particularly my role as majority leader, I spent a lot of my, I'm not on any committees, right? So I spent a lot of times in individual meetings with people, groups, advocacy groups, um, state agencies who have business before the legislature. And I get to read, uh, I get to learn about the amazing amount of policy that we are responsible for acting on. Um, and I, I just can, even after 15 years, I continue to be fascinated by all the different issues that get brought before us um, that I have a responsibility to learn about so that I can try to lead our caucus and bring us to cons consensus to try to get some of that work done. Right. Um, can you speak a little bit about what your position entails, like bringing the caucus together? You know, what is your job description as majority leader? Yeah, um, you know, primarily I'm responsible for what I like to say is managing the legislative process. So for the last two and a half months, all of our committees have been engaged in really important work of raising bills, having public hearings, and now we're at the point where committees are be our committees are beginning to report their bills out of committee. And we know back in January there were probably two or three thousand bills that were proposed um, this session. Um, that number has probably been whittled down to I don't know fifteen hundred bills. I'm guessing here. Um, but once all the bills get out of committee, myself and a team of deputies, along with our staff, will read all the bills that come out on a weekly basis. We will read them all. 
and then make decisions about what happens to that bill next. So if that bill has a piece in it that is the cognizance of another committee, that bill needs to go that, that committee for additional review. We'll make decisions about that. Um, if the committee, ha if the bill has a fiscal note, it's going to cost money, it has to go to a probes. Um, if it's going to reduce revenue or raise revenue, it has to go to the finance committee. Um, if it has a criminal penalty in it, it has to go to the Judiciary Committee. Um, so as Democrats, House Democrats, we'll go through that process of looking through all the bills, make determinations about where it needs to go next. But then our Republican colleagues have a similar process. They have a team that looks through every bill. They make decisions about where they think the bill needs to go next. Um, and then we'll get together, compare notes, and negotiate. Um, they want to refer more of our bills to more committees than we would like to, um, because every time you send a bill to another committee, it increases the chances that that bill is going to die and not come back. Um, so they will request a lot of referrals. We will grant some of them. We will not grant others. Um, and that process will take place. We wait for the bills to come back. Then we screen them again. And then we make determinations about what bills we're going to call on the actual floor of the House and take final action. And you know, we're not going to get to all those bills by the end of session. We might act on 250, 300 bills in total. Now, some of those bills might take pieces of other bills and be included in a bill, but ultimately right. we'll pass 250, 300 bills that become law. Um, so when, by the time we get to final action on the floor, myself and the speaker and our teams are responsible for making determinations about, you know, what's going to get called next, what bills need further negotiation, what bills need an amendment, what bills need further discussion with the proponent of the bill. It's a lot of give and take between us and the Republicans, a lot of give and take between us and the governor's office, and a lot of give and take between us in the Senate. Um, so it's my job to work with all those different parties to try to build consensus and get to a point where we can get a bill called on the floor. It's an incredible amount of multitasking, right? It, it, it is. Um, <laughs> session days are really interesting for me and my desk. As you know, I sit in my desk basically the whole time. I rarely, I don't get to leave too much. Uh, but I constantly have just information and people coming at me for 10, 12, 15 hours a day, or while I'm sitting there listening to the debate as well, too. Um, but right. again, managing that floor process to make sure that we keep moving and debating on bills. And an excellent job you do with your staff. Well, thank you so much for coming on the porch today and sharing your journey to the legislature um, and all that you do. And I am excited about this upcoming, um, you know, to see what bills get through. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for having me. It's always a good opportunity to reach some of your constituents or some of your listeners in the Windsor and uh, Windsor Locks area and, and yeah. you know, try to demystify the process a little bit more and, and demystify all of us as human beings too. Right, exactly. Thank you so much. So thank you everyone for um, being on the porch with us and we'll see you next time. <laughs>